we're starting this hangout now at uh, 11, uh, 106 uh, East Coast time. So welcome everybody. This is Scientific Americans uh, Hangout with Google Plus uh, about climate change and how it's affecting uh, winter sports, mostly um, snow sports since it's winter time. Um, let me introduce our guests and then we can just get started. So um, just say hi. I guess you guys have your names up there. Thanks. I can't get that to work for me, so we'll just go from there. So Steve Fisher. Um, hey, Steve. He is a uh, two-time X Games snowboard gold medalist and um, lives in Breckenridge, Colorado. He now works at an ad agency. I don't know what you guys promote, but that's interesting. Um, and uh, we have Andrew Murray. Hey, Andrew, who is a meteorologist and a CTO, Chief Technology Officer, I believe, at Open Snow, which specializes in um, weather forecasts for ski areas. Uh, and he used to work for the National Weather Service, and he's in Boulder, I believe. Yep. Um, I'm Mark Fischetti. I'm an editor of Scientific American. I'm in Western Massachusetts. Um, I live in a small town that's about 20 minutes from three different ski areas. Uh, not big like in Colorado, but nonetheless. Um, so we're just going to get started, and um, we'll talk for a little while. And people, if you're on, if you're on and watching, if you want to chat, um, just type in the chat box. I can't seem to get that to work for me. I can read it. I just can't type. So. I'll see if you have questions, and uh, about uh, 20 minutes from now, we'll we'll open it up as well. Um, so, Steve, um, tell me about snow and boarding, and then Andrew, I'm going to ask you a bit about how climate change may affecting uh, maybe affecting the quality of the snow that Steve ha is trying to board on. Hey, Mark. Hey, everybody. Thanks uh, for having me today. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So obviously. As I'm sure many of you have kind of noticed, the just wild changes of, of snow and uh, weather patterns over the last couple of years. I know uh, it's been pretty dry there. Uh, originally from Minnesota, and you know, when I was growing up, there was always tons of snow when I was a kid. And um, you know, I've been out in Colorado for about 10 years, and uh, we've had a, a lot of snow. And then the last two years have been pretty dry. So you know, it's it's just interesting to see the change in. Uh, weather patterns and obviously the difference of climate that uh, we've been experiencing. Yeah. Um, uh, Andrew, I want to ask you about that, but I, I, sorry, I forgot to introduce the gang of people looking on in the other small window here who are uh, from Scientific American, um, Robin Lloyd, Rachel Shear, and Carissa Lynch. Hi. Um, they're actually running the Hangout, so thank you. Because <laughs> the rest of us don't know what we're doing there. Um, Andrew, what about that? It seems like the snow uh, falls have been maybe more variable, or maybe we're getting like big storms and then nothing instead of what would maybe be a more sort of regular pattern. Um, is is there any evidence for that? Uh, is it anecdotal? Do we know? The word regular and meteorology, I don't know, go along. <laughs> like everyone focuses <laughs> very much on normal, and the funny thing with normal is it just it's the average out of all that. So as Steve said, I mean past two years, especially here in Colorado, have been on the drier side. Um, all of us in Colorado definitely remember two years, a year before those, which was one of the best years we probably had in three decades. Um, the thing with snow, a lot of uh, snow, especially in the western United States, is uh, one or two or three storms can make or break a season out here. So if you don't get the right storm path, you can go from having a normal uh, average season to a below or above average season just because of one or two storms. So it's kind of, it's, and especially it's noticeable in the ski industry because with us, you're hoping it snows in a 10 mile by 10 mile area. <laughs> right, right. Um, t tell, tell us a little bit about what open snow does and if, if forecasting snowfalls for ski areas or anywhere is getting more challenging. So, uh, I mean, so Open Snow does snow forecasting for every ski area in the United States right now. It's a uh, it's a fun job. We get to we get to help people have fun. Uh, for us, I mean, the difficulty just comes storm by storm. It's uh, I mean, the perfect example is the storm coming to hit actually the Front Range, so not the ski areas, but more right. so Denver this coming weekend. Right. Uh, weather models are only so good, and when it comes with snow, a hundred miles. North, 100 miles south, can mean a difference between three inches and three feet. <laughs> uh -huh. So, I mean, it really comes down to the science behind forecasting. And it's improving, but it's still only improving so far to the point we can actually 
predict long range exact snow air exact snowfalls. Right. So I mean, what what you hear in the general media and even just you know people at ski areas are talking that you hear that uh, maybe it's worry, maybe it's just um, lack of understanding about climate change. That you know, I think the basic idea is, hey, it's going to get warmer, and so we're going to have less snow. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the evidence shows or what you think may be happening. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the one thing everyone think associates climate change is with, uh, with just kind of warming overall. Uh, I'm not a huge climate expert. My background is meteorology, not climatology. Yeah, but, yeah, okay, right. So for me, I know more of the short-term stuff. Uh, the thing with snowfall variability is it, it varies very much uh, year to year, as in the case of like three years ago was the best season we had in 30 years, even though that following summer was probably the driest summer we've had. So, uh, I mean, people, the funny thing is we notice with our site, when it's not snowing, everyone notices. When it is snowing, everyone's too busy to care. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Um, Steve, well, we, were, we were talking um, the other day, and you, you, you mentioned something about, um, uh, you know, professional competitions not uh, there used to be more of them in the Northeast, and there don't seem to be many anymore. Um, is that the case, or has the sort of the venues for these big uh, competitions changed? Steve, are you still there? Yep, back, okay. back. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, there used to be uh, quite a few more professional level, elite level contests. Um, in snow sports that happened in the Northeast uh, recently, a lot of that has changed. Some of it is due to the change in climate, but um, you know, some of it is obviously due to other reasons as well. But you know, the, the climate change is one of the bigger reasons because snow used to be reliable uh, in the Northeast, particularly in Vermont, Northern New York, um, even up in Quebec, Canada. Uh, there is a lot of events up there. Uh, years ago, and now um, you know everything's really moved west into the Rockies, the Canadian Rockies, and um, all the way in the Northwest uh, as of the last five years. And that's just kind of seems to be the trend. And I think a lot of it is because um, you know it's just not as reliable anymore. It's interesting. That, um, it, as I mentioned, I, I live in uh, Western Massachusetts, where cross country skiing is a big deal. Yeah. Um, a lot of schools have teams and they compete on the weekends. Uh, but when I first moved here, which is 20 years ago, that was happening even at local golf courses and things like that. Yeah. Now they're they're finding themselves moving, having to go to Vermont, southern Vermont, for for any kind of snow right. in the winter time. Um, uh, so Andrew, is uh, are, is this just anecdotal or? Um, I mean, so I mean. The funny thing is, uh, with the, especially with the Western United States, I don't know Eastern United States, so I actually, I've grown up in Colorado, I've only lived out West, so... Um, so you my, don't care about us in Massachusetts, I'm right? Saying, co my uh, co-founder <laughs> is actually from Pennsylvania, so he grew up ski team for Penn State, and uh, we always kind of banter back and forth of, I've never skied bad snow in my life. Uh -huh. um, but, I mean, I, I remember back in 2003 here in Colorado, uh, I think it was... It was a spring break weekend. We got four feet of snow. And yeah. I, everyone in Colorado remembers the March 03 storm. It was it was one of the biggest storms I've ever experienced. And those just aren't happening very much anymore. I mean, I, I, I have not seen one of those since. And it's it's part of a trend, but who, as with how it was three years ago and this year, the trend could reverse in two years. We could have a good – that was a strong La Nina year that year. So we could get one of those back, and we could have another amazing snow season. But the current trend, the past five years, especially uh, out west here, where um, the snowfall is not only for skiing, but our entire water supply for the entire season, uh, has been trending downwards. Right. Um, we we published an article in Scientific American about a year ago um, called "The Rain Bands Are Moving." Um, you can find it on scientificamerican.com. And it, it basically was looking at sort of the change, changes in where rainfall is occurring. And, and it, it, was, it went back thousands and thousands of years. You know, they dig cores down into the earth to find out about moisture levels. And basically what they were saying was that the rain bands that um, they basically move east to west, or, I'm sorry, west to east across the Pacific and then across uh, Mexico and the U.S., 
they're shifting a little bit in the tropics, which is actually pushing the dry band that, you know, we consider northern Mexico dry most of the time, right, and the southwest dry. They're, they're starting to um, push that dry band, if you will, a little further north, which might um, then push the, the wetter band north of that further north. So it could, you know, it could be that across Colorado, um, that's sort of the central um, part of the country where you do get lots of snow. Um, that could be one cause of there being less snowpack. Yeah, what you mentioned about snowpack being the primary source of water is a great concern to a lot of people out that way because it does seem to be getting um, less deep and yeah. it also seems to be melting earlier in the springtime so that um, if you have more weeks of even even initial week or two of dry weather, then more of that snow is melting and you know, evaporating instead of soaking into the ground, which leaves you less water throughout the summertime. And that's the big difference between the West Coast and East Coast is because of the big concerns with water, actually, we know snowfall out, like we can just, we know the snowfall amounts out West so much better because of a system uh, called Snowtel, which is the sensor stakes and all over the Western United States, I think there's a couple hundred of them. I don't know the exact number. Uh, that system only exists pretty much from the eastern state of, uh, eastern border of Colorado westward. Uh, the east coast doesn't have anything like that, so it's it's harder to know in very high resolution the snowpack out east compared to out west. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Steve, we, where you said there are less competitions in the northeast, where, and that they're moving out west. Where are they moving to? Uh, you know, typically Colorado, even though, as Andrew said, you know, the last two years have been a bit below average in terms of snowfall and precipitation, but uh, there's, you may have heard the Burton U.S. Open just happened right, right, yeah, right. in Vail, which originally was in Stratton, Vermont for 30 uh, plus years, and, um, you know, so they transitioned from an East Coast event for I mean, a lifetime to being out in Vail now, and they're under a five-year agreement with Vail Resorts, and, um, you know, the history behind that was they had a five-year agreement with Stratton Mountain initially, and they were there for 30, so it seems like that's going to be a partnership that stays uh, for a very long term. Um, do Tour events used to uh, do kind of scattered across the country, uh, and then they've consolidated, and now they only do one event in Breckenridge, resorts uh, and then you know just countless of other contests that uh, used to kind of happen in and around the uh, upper northeast uh, over there like fist world cups and other things like that have just kind of transitioned a little bit further west um, you know as I said before I grew up in Minnesota and you know it's kind of going back a little bit to Andrew's point about uh, snowfall back way back when you know I, I remember growing up and having several snow days um, a year where, you know, they would cancel school and I would get out the sled and go <laughs> sledding all day or snowboard or whatever. And, you know, now it just, it seems like you watch the weather channel periodically and yeah. people will call a, a winter storm warning for three inches. Yeah, right. Know, where before that used to be like 20 inches plus was a winter storm warning and now it just seems to be decreasing and decreasing so it's it's just kind of interesting that the change from I think when we were younger and um, kind of experienced the bigger snowstorms uh, a little bit more frequently where now they uh, they don't really happen in the US as much as they used to it seems um, I want to remind people if you, if you want to chime in or uh, ask a question just to do it through the chat um, window I'm uh, Robin. I don't know if you're seeing the chat window moving or not. I'm worried about my screen, and I'm not seeing something that happening. Uh, I think there's nothing. Okay. All right. That's good. Actually, I see a couple of questions on the uh, the actual event page. Oh, you do. Okay. Uh, one <laughs> one from Jason Osborne asks if uh, warmer conditions drive winter sports enthusiasts to colder locations. Huh or more folks leaning to warmer weather sports as an alternative? Well, okay, so who wants to handle that one? I mean, I guess I'll field that one. Uh, yeah. You know, we winter sport enthusiasts will chase snow no matter what, um, <laughs> you know, so it's not like we 
habit you know inhabit a, a a colder climate just because of it but um you know if if you're a big enough enthusiast and and love snow that much i mean you're going to go to alaska or norway or um you know places where it it gets heavier snowfall kind of regardless you're right. not necessarily going to move there yeah yeah, yeah. you'll try well, you know I actually have Skip, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. I was gonna say, if you want to chase snow, Valdez, Alaska, was the place to be. I think it was last year. They had 600 plus inches of snow during the season. So, wow. if you don't mind Valdez, Alaska. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have a sort of a related question. Um, uh, maybe start with Steve. Uh, so, you know, if places like Stratton, which is basically the biggest skier in the Northeast, um, are are struggling, that must mean. Uh, more man-made snow and less natural snow. Um, yeah. And if if that's sort of going to be a trend, you know, through for recreational boarders and skiers as well. Um, and, you know, everybody sort of skied on both and boarded on both. But t tell us a little bit about the difference between, let's say, a completely man-made snow slope and a completely natural snow in terms of technique and even, you know, how well you can do out there. Yeah, I mean, it will... The good thing is, is technology has gotten pretty good in terms of man-made snow and over the years. I mean, it used to be when I was growing up, um, just really icy and, and really, really hard packed compared to coming out west and kind of getting the natural snow, which is a little bit flakier, a little fluffier. Um, right. I don't know if you guys have seen, but like snowmakers, you know, it's really fine, fine snow crystals that they make. So it, it when it packs together, it, it really packs hard, you know, and kind of creates a little bit icier uh, terrain, but um, the natural snow is just a little bit softer. But so with the technology and everything, I mean, I think everybody utilizes snow making pretty significantly compared to obviously before when the technology wasn't very good or efficient. And um, I think, uh, Mark, I was telling you when we spoke last week, but, um, you know, there are places in um, northern Ohio uh, Michigan, Minnesota, that really rely on yeah. snowmaking, and now they go weeks out of the year when it's too warm and they don't want to make snow, so they just shut down. And you know, people can't ski in in northern Ohio or Michigan, Minnesota, North Dakota, like the upper Midwest there, where you know that it just hurts business. Right. Right. So, um, Andrew, if if we're going to go to more and more man-made snow, uh, because people aren't getting forecasts from you that said, "Hey, we're going to get through feet of snow," um, what what kind of atmospheric conditions are they looking for that could maybe optimize the snowmaking? Uh, so, I mean, for snowmaking, it really comes down to uh, actually we have a whole thing on, on open snow in our news. Uh, uh, Joel went up and actually followed the Vale crews making snow for uh, all night. And, and uh -huh. Their work schedules lift closed, the glyph open. But uh, I mean, so the main thing is back, uh, back east. Yeah, uh, Steve is right that the the snowmaking is becoming almost 100 percent of their production for a lot of the mountains. Uh, out west, uh, it's it actually a lot of them are almost capped at what they can make just based on water rights. So I mean, uh -huh. the funny thing is, if you're not getting snow, you're not getting water, which means you can't make snow. It's it's almost <laughs> a detrimental cycle at that point. Right. <laughs> So a lot of them you'll see out, um, out west here. Once you get the first good snowfall, they're just they're done for the season making snow because it's not worth the money or anything else. Huh. That's interesting. So what? Uh, but if you are making snow, is it is it um, better yeah. for the temperature to be really cold or is it really cold? Not I'm pulling up the exact numbers right now because I'm sitting here going, right, I know okay. these numbers and I can't remember exactly what they were. Uh, it's it's the low twenties in terms below twenty yeah snow making it's, and they want as dry as the air can possibly be so as long as it's not dry humid. and cold that's the why, simple why why really dry uh, again you know it's all with the the machinery and the technology so that the uh, the snow crystals are optimized at less humidity and and huh. low twenties I don't know the exact science behind it. But, um, it's, it's the same reason people like they say they like skiing the champagne powder of Steamboat or uh, Utah's powder just because uh, if you go far enough west um, there's the term uh, Sierra cement it's just because the snow is so heavy and dense because of the high water content from them being close to the coast uh -huh. uh, the same reason Utah gets drier snow, Colorado gets drier snow except when we get our storms on the front range because that's moisture from the Gulf of Mexico it, 
drier snow is better to ski is more fun to ski i would say huh. so when you're making snow then you're trying to make dry snow if, if you're going to make if you're going to make dry snow you can make uh you can make more of it for, with less water and oh. it's it's just better to ski if you have to think the water content if you're spraying gallons of water into the air to make big dense snowflakes it's not it's not creating an ideal snowflake and it's wasting a lot of water huh. I, I, I'd like for you to post us a picture of the ideal snowflake, maybe when we're done. <laughs> uh -huh. The ideal snowflake. Yeah, all right, all right. Um, Andrew, I'm going to rely on you if you see anybody else on the chat with questions, uh, if you don't mind, because I, I, it's just not coming up for me. Um, so it just interrupt uh, at any time. Uh, Trevor, uh, made, uh, uh, Trevor Denton made a comment about it snowed in Phoenix. I guess it was that last week. Yeah, it was last week. So that was the perfect example of how uh, winter seasons can be defined by one storm or another. It was, I mean, Phoenix has not seen snow in decades, and they got, I remember seeing photos all over my Twitter feed of, it's snowing in Phoenix, and everyone freaking out. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't really sticking, but it was, it was snowing in Phoenix. Yeah, okay. Right, and wasn't it two years ago or three years ago, it snowed in northern Florida and, and parts of Georgia and you know, ruined a lot of the orange and, and peach crops for the summer. Yeah, that was uh, three years ago. That was our really snowy season. Actually, the entire country was snowy that year. It was yeah. the first time, I think, since we had modern satellite. Uh, there's a satellite system that actually keeps track of snow cover on the ground. It was the first time it ever recorded snow in all 50 states. Yeah, wow. Ah, so. That's interesting, too, right? So we're oh. in the middle of a dry trend, and then you have a year like 07, 08. Uh, not 07, right? That's not three years ago. <laughs> um, 2010, yeah. 2011. Um, and that year is a lot, is, of course, the anomaly year, or not anomaly or normal or whatever it is. Right, 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 right. right. Um, just before we leave the man made snow ideas, um, Steve, what, uh, I, I hesitate to ask the question now because I was going to ask what's the real difference? Um, in technique for skiing on man-made or boarding on man-made snow versus natural, but you know, hearing about the moisture content makes me wonder if there isn't just just kind of a continuum. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's there's no difference in technique. It's just uh, you know when it's icy, you're a little bit more careful, and you know when it's it's soft, powdery, and fluffy, you typically take more chances. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so one other thing I was thinking about. Um, what we what we've said on scientificamerican.com, what, what uh, expert authors who we have said that um, one adaptation to climate change that they're already seeing is that certain certain species are moving either northward, you know, in latitude because of changes in temperature and maybe maybe um, in water availability, and they're also moving higher in elevation, particularly like beetles, right? And there's this uh, big pine beetle problem out west. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just, just stripping trees of all their leaves, and it's happening at the highest levels in the mountains, or higher than it used to, because they're moving up in elevation. So this is kind of a silly t t uh, connection, but you know, are skiing competitions moving either up in elevation or north in latitude? Um, no, not not yet. Anyway, um, there are a couple of you know events that happen in Alaska or you know northern Canada like that, but. Uh, not many, and most of those are more uh, free riding rather than half pipe, slope style, and freestyle type stuff. You know, I think um, uh, what I'm accustomed to with the half pipe and, and slope style is is mostly just kind of going to bigger, more visible resorts to help kind of expand the sport and, and increase visibility. Okay, great. Um, the the competition you mentioned it, it was just last weekend, right? Yeah, yeah, the Burton U.S. Open. It just happened uh, in Vail last weekend, and that was the first um, you know major snowboard event that uh, has occurred there since the Honda Session, which I think the last year that was there was maybe two thousand eight, something uh -huh. like that. So it, it's been a while for Vail, and you know it's good to have uh, their support again in the freestyle snowboard community and uh, the event was tremendous it was it was great you know I've been doing the US Open probably for like 15 years out in Stratton Vermont and this one yeah. just seemed so much more professional and and 
really just done so much better. Um, you know, less of a less of a kind of flying by the seat of their pants, and they really had yeah, it all yeah. kind of dialed in, and and was really good. Right. Uh, that's the first snowboard word I've heard you use so far, you know, dialed in. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dope, the half, it's half pipe, right? So, um, uh, and that's what you used to specialize in, half pipe? Yep, yep. Okay. I competed in half pipe for 12 years or so. Well, longer than that, but professionally for 12 years. So what's that surface like? I'm curious, because you see it on TV and, you know, you never really hear anything about it, but... It's firm, yeah. Firm. Usually, it's it's pretty firm, yeah. Um, unless yeah, it's a daytime event, where in this case for the U.S. Open last weekend, it was pretty warm in Vail. Um, I mean, that was optimum conditions for for a half pipe. It was like thirty six degrees and sunny, and you know, it was just soft enough where you weren't scared. <laughs> well, maybe you weren't. <laughs> um, so. so uh, uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm just really curious when I see guys doing the half pipe, girls doing the half pipe, and they get, you know, they're going up to one side and they're going straight up, right? And then you're going to do some maneuver to come straight down again. What's yep. what's that? When you leave the surface and when you reconnect with the surface, what does that actually feel like? Uh, zero gravity. Feels like yeah. flying. You know, I mean, that's as, as close as you can get to weightlessness and you know just matching the transition perfectly is uh, I mean it's a feeling you can't even describe it's like going down a roller coaster and and being weightless for that second but it's a little bit longer than that so it's it's pretty awesome huh. hey cool. Mark it's Robin um, yeah. a couple of our participants in the hangout have asked questions okay great and I just posted them to the chat um, but one of them just went right for the jugular and said, do we think that skiing or boarding will die if it becomes harder to get to a mountain with enough snow? Okay. Who wants that one? <laughs> I think I-70 will be harder to get up than it will be to, for less snow. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I mean, uh, as we've found with our company, there will always be people that will find snow. It, it, they, they will chase it to the ends of the earth. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, go ahead, I, Steve. Well, I was going to say, I think, I think the the takeaway from that question is, is I mean, are ski and snowboard hard good brands actually going to be able to sell product at that point? I mean, are enough people going to be interested if there's no snow? And you know, here's Burton, K2 Sports, um, Rosignol, you know, all these multi-million to billion-dollar companies that. What happens to them? Yeah, yeah. Another guy says um, they had snowfall in Phoenix a week or two ago, and for the first time in 29 years, he had never seen anything like it. So you do get these strange outbursts, I guess, right? Yeah. That one. That one. I think we did. Uh, Andrew did pick that one up. So, so maybe, <laughs> maybe by the time we're done, the technology will catch up, and we'll all be on the same page, literally. On the screen. Oh, here's one more. Uh, yeah. Some guy says, as a native Utah, he's proud of his the greatest snow on earth that they have there, and he heard, he heard that dryness has to do with the reasons related to the precipitation and snowfall in the Sierra Nevada. Is uh, is there any science behind that? Any meteorology that could explain or affect that? Andrew, I'm going to let you, let you take that one, but first you have to tell us if Utah does have the best snow in the world. <laughs> So here's the fun. I am a I'm a Colorado native that <laughs> did my undergrad at Utah uh, with oh. the at the time the chair of department Jim Steenberg who's like all right where's your allegiance at Utah or Colorado right. and I had to sit there like oh crap <laughs> like I don't want to make this decision um, it all depends on the storm I mean the the greatest snow on earth comes from the uh, concept of liquid to uh, snow ratios so. The way you measure water constant of snow is you take the amount of snow you get and you melt it down, um, and it's how much snow would equal one inch of water. So there's like the general idea that 20 inches of snow should equal one inch of water because it's the perfect powder to go cruising through and it makes the great photos and everything like that. Uh -huh. um, the way Utah and Steamboat and Colorado would all argue that is that uh, the further you get away from the moisture source, so in this case the ocean, uh, right. the less 
what our content is is in uh, the atmosphere overall. So the snow dries out because there's less moisture overall. So that's why here's that. Uh, I'm re rereading the question. Uh, so the wet junk, as he put it, all over the Sierras, they um, <laughs> they they're, they get more of uh, eight to ten inches of snow per inch of water, uh, mostly because they are a couple hundred miles from the coast. They have a lot of moisture content in the snow. Uh, that same kind of snow falls in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, etc. By the time you get to Utah, Colorado, the storm is dried out, so we do get less less snow, um, but. It doesn't. It would. It's not a linear correlation. It's a. Right. Uh, we get more snow because it, not more snow overall, but we get more snow because it's drier. But it's less because it's drier. So well. when somebody's bragging about getting a foot of snow, um, it may be a lot and it may not, huh? <laughs> yeah, you put a foot of snow in, in the Sierras is not a big deal. A foot of snow here in Colorado is a huge deal. Yeah. No, it's a, you uh, you hear it and you hear it here in the Northeast too when uh, when we have snowfalls and and you know inevitably some uh, weather forecaster on local TV news will say well you know if this was rain we would have gotten two inches of rain and I actually, so I'm glad you brought up those numbers because I always wondered if there was a rate of conversion but as you say it really varies widely yeah and it varies from storm to storm uh, here in Colorado, if the, it pulls in moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, we can get a very dense spring storm. Most of the storms in Colorado are like that. Uh, mm -hmm. The same thing goes if we get a good December storm that comes down from the Canadian Rockies. It's a very dry storm. It's a lot of snow from the mountains. It's, it's the perfect powder that everyone thinks of when they see the videos and the GoPro uh, footage on YouTube. Right. Um, so, Steve, it, what about... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. And I was going to say, and that's the other uh, kind of funny thing is I think D.C. got... 10, 15 inches of snow, and the the world freaked out. It was Weather Channel was naming it and everything, and we have we're thinking a foot of snow out here in Denver on Saturday. And I don't think anyone's really talking about it right now. <laughs> right. We're all just kind of like, cool, it's gonna snow this weekend. So, right. so Steve, what about you? Utah got the best snow in the world, and where where <laughs> where well, have you been? Just, that might have a few rivals. Yeah, I was going to chime in. I think uh, Utah claiming the greatest snow on earth is more of an advertising and marketing thing than any uh, actual science behind it. I think, uh, you know, in order to get people out there to spend money at resorts and, and ski and stuff is obviously the reason for that. Same as, okay. you know, champagne powder of Colorado. And um, But, you know, I, I think every everywhere is different. You know, Utah has fantastic snow. Colorado has fantastic snow. Northwest has fantastic snow. Uh, I would say one of the craziest um, places I've ever been was India. Um, India. You know, and that's kind of, yeah, I went snowboarding for uh, a story I did with Transworld Snowboarding uh, years ago, and we went to northern India right near the border of Pakistan and that was I mean some of the most insane deep snow I've I've ever ever experienced you know I was there for like 10 days and um, I mean it just dumped snow the entire time I was there um, literally choking on it so it was, it was <laughs> a hell of an experience so what were you we doing there? Uh, just snowboarding um, you could probably Search for it online. I'm I'm guessing maybe, but uh, yeah, Transworld snowboarding, and then it was called uh, um, uh, something a Himalayan adventure. Um, but yeah, it was myself and a couple other uh, professional snowboarders that we just kind of wanted to go somewhere different that no one had ever really been. Right. Uh, check out the mountains and have a good time. So yeah, we uh, we got to snowboard for ten days. Uh, the place was called Gulmarg, um, huh. and it was north western India. Like I said, right on the Pakistani border. Right. Um, I think we were like two hundred kilometers away from K two, uh, which is a peak in Pakistan, uh, second tallest in the world, I think. Right. And um, yeah, it was it was just an incredible incredible experience. So no man-made snow there. <laughs> Definitely none, none <laughs> at all. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. I, I at least would not have associated skiing with India, although it makes perfect geographic yeah. sense. So is it a big sport there? 
it's not, you know, but it, it's definitely growing. Um, the way I found it was through a Australian um, ski tourism kind of service. Uh, the place that we went uh, had one uh, lift or gondola. It was kind of a, a hybrid lift gondola thing that looked like it came from the 30s. Um, so it was, it was interesting. You know, most of the stuff we did was actually hike access and uh, we would take the lift up but then hike out on a bunch of different lines and, and just kind of go about our business, uh, documenting, taking photos and jumping off of things and uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was interesting and it, it's, you know, the resort as I say, resort, it's definitely not a resort, but uh, the way that it worked there was you, you pay per ride, so it's not like you buy a day lift ticket like you do huh. here in the States or anywhere else, but um, you pay per ride and you just, you get a one one pass for each time you want to ride the lift and ride, um, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of mountains as brave as you are to want to go out. Right. So hopefully it's a long lift if you're paying for each one. Yeah, it's pretty long. Well, and the, the beauty about it was it was like ten dollars per ride. So I mean, it wasn't wasn't a whole lot of a lot of break in the bank. You know, it's definitely no uh, one hundred and twenty dollars for day pass or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, so if there's anybody sees any more online uh, or chat questions, um, bring them up. And otherwise, if Steve and Andrew, you have some last thing you want to say about climate and snow and sports and winter sports, go ahead. I mean, I, I think I covered everything I wanted to. <laughs> All right. Good. Same here. I want to go skiing. That's what I want to go to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get off there and go skiing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, just lastly, tell us uh, how we can find people. I see, Andrew, and you're... Um, Lower third, as they say, your your name up on the window. It says opensnow.com, so we people can find you there. You can find me there. Okay. And uh, Steve, what about you? I uh, find me on Google Plus. I I work at an advertising agency now in Denver. You're welcome to check that out. It's called Amelie Company, and uh, you know we kind of do everything. So check out the website and hit me up if you need anything. Okay. Good. And if you're interested in Scientific American, at scientificamerican.com. Um, we're going to uh, we've we've done some hangouts. We're getting better at it, so we'll probably do more. And in the meantime, um, just check out the website. Uh, some of these articles that I raised are all available there. Um, but thanks, Steve. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Rachel and Robin. Um, uh, this was actually it's been fun, and I'm surprised that it's 45 minutes in already. <laughs> so um, we'll we'll all get going. But thank everybody for your time, and hopefully we'll keep in touch. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Ciao.